Now, CoreDraw has a fantastic array of tools in the toolbox here for drawing standard shapes such as squares, circles, rectangles, polygons, etc. But when it comes to drawing more organic shapes and more flowing shapes, then this is when you really have to get to know your curve tools. And let's take a quick look at the topics we're going to be covering today. So I'm going to be starting off with a quick introduction to the shape tool. Now after the pick tool, the shape tool is probably the second most um, popular tool that you're going to be using in Coral Draw. It's used for shaping all sorts of objects, not just curves, and we'll be taking a look at that. Now I'm a great believer in beginning with basics, and before we actually start using our curve tools, we're going to be looking at the following topics. Vectors versus bitmaps, understanding nodes. Now I know when I first started using CorelDRAW, I tried to use the drawing tools and found that when I was pulling on the control handles, the nodes weren't exactly behaving the way I expected them to behave. So we're going to be looking at the different types of nodes and why they behave the way, that, the way they do. We're going to take a quick look at Bezier curves and also the types of lines and paths that are used when drawing these wonderful organic shapes here. We'll be looking at working with curves, reshaping curves, um, moving different nodes and mirroring nodes, replacing nodes, and anything and everything to do with shaping curves we're going to be taking a look at. Now if you're um, working as a vinyl cutter or if you're working with embroidery, this, this um, chapter here, Reverse and Curve Direction, might be very important for you because a lot of plotters and a lot of embroidery machines cut out vinyl or stitch in a specific direction based on the curve direction. So if some of your curves, for, ex for example, are going in the wrong direction, this could give you issues and I'm going to show you how to reverse the curve direction. Now sometimes we can extract parts of objects from other objects just by extracting subparts. And once we've covered all of our topics on working with nodes, we're going to start using the drawing tools and the artistic media tool docker. So let's get started with the shape tool. Now you'll find the shape tool here directly below the pick tool, and it's together with the other reshaping brushes, the smudge brush, rough and brush and pre-transform for example. So when you do um, review this webinar, I've put some bullet points here, so you can at any time just pause the film and just read through these bullet points if you want to be reminded of certain things. So it's one of the most frequently used tools in Coral Draw and is used for shaping all kinds of objects, but the behavior of the shape tool will depend on the type of object that is being reshaped. So let's take a look at some of the things we have here. Here I have a simple rectangle, and I'm just going to zoom in here. And what you can see here is, this is just a simple rectangle drawn with a rectangle tool. And with the shape tool, I do have four handles at each corner that look like nodes. And when I drag these with my shape tool, I can actually round off the corners. But that's about all I can do. I can't actually change the shape in any other way. So in this case, what I first need to do is to go up to Arrange and convert this rectangle to curves. And once I've done that, let's just give this a little lighter color here. You can actually see we actually have nodes here. So I can now go into here and really start reshaping this rectangle. Let's just zoom out again for a second. So here I have two lines of text, and if I click on the text with my shape tool, I get these two handles here. The first handle here is for letter spacing, and the vertical handle here is for line spacing. And if I grab these little squares here, you can actually take single letters and move them around and rotate them, etc. And if you want to actually space the words rather than the letters, all you need to do is hold down the shift key and the shape tool allows you to do some word spacing. So here we have a polygon, 
which was drawn using our polygon tool. Let me just zoom into this for a second. Now the polygons are normally drawn with nodes at specific points here. And the great thing about the polygon tool is, is that when I move one node, all of the nodes will move with it. And by just rotating these nodes around on the page, you can get some really fantastic shapes going here. So here in the corner we have a bitmap and this is just a pixel based image and it's not something you would normally associate with reshaping with the shape tool. But let's just have a quick look at this. In fact, although I have a picture here with the shape tool, I can actually reshape my image. Now this is non-destructive editing, I'm not actually destroying any parts of my image here. And if I choose a node, and we'll be looking at all of this in more detail a little later on, and convert it to a curve, I can actually go in and create some wonderful shapes from my bitmaps. You can, if you actually want to cut something out, go to Arrange, Shaping, and you can even put a boundary around the outside of this. And with this boundary, you've got something here that's perfect, for example, for doing vinyl cutting. Now if I go back to my shape tool, if I decide I don't actually like what I've done with my bitmap, I can go around, let's just perhaps zoom out here again for this, I can actually go around the whole of my bitmap with my shape tool and all I need to do is press the delete button and I have my original image back again. So I think you're probably getting to see how versatile the shape tool actually is. And finally, what I have here is just a curve drawn with one of our curve tools, which we'll be seeing later on. And here you can see you have the nodes and you have the control handles here for changing the shape of that line. So in a nutshell, the shape tool is very, very versatile. And if you want to do some proper creative designing in Coral Draw, it's going to be one of the tools that together with the pick tool you're going to be using the most frequently. So let's take a look now at bitmaps versus vectors. Because um, you often get questions about, well, I can just put lots of images in here and why should I use vectors? I have here an example of two bitmaps. It's actually a bitmap split into two halves. This side I have an image which is 72 dpi and here I have 300 dpi and I'm just going to go back to my pick tool and just zoom in here for a second. And you see on the 72 dpi side the image is already very pixelated and what this means is, is that when I try to make my bitmap larger, for example, these pixels are going to get larger and larger and at one point it's going to get very blocky and it's completely unacceptable as far as the quality goes. And here, although I have 300 dpi, again, if you zoom into this, at some point you're going to hit the pixel level where you start seeing all the um, single artifacts. Now, what is a vector? Now, a vector has nothing at all to do with pixels. Vectors are shapes, curves, lines, etc., which are based on mathematical algorithms. So whenever you scale up or scale down a vector, all the core draw is doing is redoing the math in the background. And that is why with a vector, there is no loss of quality at all when you resize the vector. And and bitmaps on the hand, as we said, are based on pixels and the size here does matter. So this is a, a flower here, and it's actually a group of vector bar. We're at 101%. So let's just go in here to say 400%. Let's just move over a little bit here. Sometimes this, this screen takes a little while to refresh if, if we're doing a webinar. And you can see here at 400%, the graphic is still perfectly smooth and we can even up this further to 1600%. And again, and you can actually, if you keep zooming in, 
you can zoom in in Coral Draw to over 250,000% and never at any time will you get anything other than a very smooth outline. So for this reason alone, it's very recommendable to do a lot of your artwork using vectors rather than pixel-based images. So now we're going to get started on looking at nodes. Now nodes are the square points at each end of a line or curve segment. And there are different types of segments and different types of nodes. So I'm just going to select this object here and zoom in. And here you can see the nodes. And at the moment, if I grab my shape tool, you can see that this is based on straight segments and you might also notice that the nodes here have no control handles whatsoever. And basically the type of node that you can use at an intersection between two segments will depend greatly on the type of node and the type of segment you're working with. And again the end node, so here we have the starting node and the end node, these again have very specific properties. And as we can see here, we have two types of segments and three types of nodes. And we'll be looking at these in one of the next chapters. So I'm just going to move on here. So a Bézier curve. So we have a French engineer called Pierre Bézier to thank for the fact that we're able to do vector graphic design at all in computers. Because it was Bézier who discovered that any curve, whether it's regular or irregular, can be defined by a node at a specific coordinate and by the control handles. And for this reason, you'll never get a node existing on its own. And you'll always have, whenever you draw a line, a minimum of two nodes. Now, if you find the nodes fairly difficult to see, in the options, you can actually change the visible size of the nodes. I'm just going to show you how to do that. We're going to go to up, up to Tools, Options, Workspace, Edit, and over here I can choose what size to use for my nodes on the screen. So I'm just going to Medium here. OK, and now you can see that the nodes are a lot bigger and perhaps a lot easier to work with. So what type of segments do we have? We can have straight segments and we can have curved segments. And we can have any combination of these. So a multi-segmented curve can be composed of straight and curved segments. And what you'll notice is, is that the end nodes, as we have here, don't have control handles. And as you can see here, perhaps, let me just zoom in here for a second. Just move across a little bit. Whenever you draw a path, the starting and end nodes are basically triangles, which are an indication of the direction of the curve. So in this case, our curve is going from the left to the right. And here's another example that we have here. And here we, again we have a curve where we have the starting node and the end node, and this is the curve direction. And when we want to change the type of segment or type of node that we have, we will find these symbols, these commands, in the property bar. And whenever you see one of these symbols grayed out, it's because this is actually the type of segment that we have at the moment. So because this is a straight segment, the straight segment here in the property bar is grayed out. And the same applies to the nodes. And we have three types of curves, and this makes, might sound a bit strange, but a curve can also be a straight line. So if we look at these two objects here, this is really a straight line. You can see here I've got two nodes, one at either end, and all I can basically do is move this object around. This, on the other hand, 
is actually a curve. But if the control handles are lying exactly along the x-axis, it could actually appear as if it is a straight line. So when you're working with shapes, it's always a good idea to, when you're clicking on your node, just to keep a quick eye out in the property bar, just to make sure what kind of line or segment or curve you're working with. So let's take a quick look at the type of nodes we can work with. So I'm just going to zoom in here for a second. So here we have a straight line. And with my shape tool, I'm just going to click in the middle to create a node. Now, if the line starts here, if the path starts here, this node will be used to determine which type of segment we want to have. So up in the property bar, I'm going to change this straight segment to a curve. So now, with my segment being converted to a curve, it's very easy to take the control handles and just change the shape of this segment here. So now we have a curve, a node, and a straight line here. Now, if I look at this node here and go up to the property bar, we have three types of nodes. We have a cusp node, and we have a smooth node. Now, at the moment, both of these are grayed out, so can we have a node that is both types? And we can indeed. And a cusp node is a node that allows us, like the cusp of a tooth or something like that, it allows us to create a very, shape ang very sharp angle. And when we're pulling on the control handles, when we have a cusp node, the segment will only be moving on one side. So here we're moving this part of the segment. I don't yet have a control handle on this side because this segment is still straight. So let's click on this node and convert this to a curve. So now we have two curves. And once we have two curves, I can basically choose which type of node I want to use here. So at the moment, I have a cusp node, but I can change this to a smooth node. And the particular thing about a smooth node is, as the name suggests, it's smooth. The two control handles, when I rotate these, they rotate in unison. But as soon as I start pulling on one of the handles, one side is going to move more than the other, but again, in a very smooth direction. So I can now smooth out this curve to the one side or the other, and that is the smooth node. So let's change our node type again. And the third type of node that we have is called a symmetrical node, and I bet you can guess what this one does. A symmetrical node has control handles that are equidistant to the, to the node that both of these handles are sharing. Again, they move in synchronicity when I'm rotating the control handles, but when I'm dragging on the handles, again, they'll move in unison. So when you're creating a shape, you really need to think about um, what type of segment do I need? Do I need something that's straight here? Do I need something that's curved? And if you are working with curves, then once you've selected your node, you need to think about, do I want to create a very sharp angle? In which case, I'm going to choose a cusp node. And then just create a very sharp angle here. Or do I want to create something that's smoother and perhaps use a smooth node? So just to recap, recap on this, a curve can be a straight line. So you need to check that um, to make sure you're working with a straight line if that's what you want. If you have a straight line, the controls handles, uh, the line nodes have no control handles, but nodes on curves do. The cusp node here will give us a sharp corner, and a cusp node can be used between straight and curved, or curved and curved, but of course you can't get a cusp node if you put a node in the middle of a straight line. The smooth nodes can be used between curved segments, and the handles move together 
when you're rotating to do that again but independently when you're pulling out the control handles from side to side and symmetrical nose, let's just change that to symmetrical again are used between curved segments the handles are equidistant from the same node and mirror each other and you can also rotate these so those are the basic types of um, curves and nodes. Now sometimes you might want to change the shape of an object by selecting several nodes and just moving the, uh, a group of nodes as a, as a whole group. So a couple of ways of selecting these. You can either take your shape tool and just go all the way around the outside. That's one way of doing this. If, however, let's say you've got lots of objects next to each other in close proximity and you can't actually get around a whole object um, by drawing a rectangle around it. Now up in the property bar, and this is the property bar of the shape tool, you have a selection mode drop down list. So you could, for example, choose to select your nodes using a freehand method, in which case you just go around here and just make a random selection of the nodes you want to use. Uh, another way of, sorry I've just jumped to the wrong page here, another way of making, um, of changing from a rectangle selection to a freehand selection is by also using the Alt key. So normally I would make a rectangle selection. If I press the Alt key, I get my freehand selection tool. So I can just toggle between um, rectangular selection mode and freehand selection mode. Here I have another curve here and the home and the end keys on your keyboard will take you from um, from one end to the other. Now I'm on my laptop here and I'm just lost at the moment for my home key but try it out on your own keyboard at home. Um, just zoom out here. So selecting a key and using the home and end keys will toggle between the first and the last node. Now if we're using the tab key, the tab key jumps from node to node along the given path and holding down the shift and the tab key is going to jump you back along that path. So again, if you're working with a designer, you've got lots of objects and you don't really want to risk pulling your object out of shape, then you can just select a node and if you don't have too many nodes, you can just jump through using your tab and your shift tab keys. So it's very easy to select all of the nodes. Now I'm just going to go on to moving nodes now. Now, to, to move a node, you basically just select it and drag on it. So that's the simplest way to move a node. If you select multiple nodes, they're all going to move in unison. So by selecting multiple nodes, you're basically moving the whole object. You can, however, and especially if you like going under view and turning on the grid, if you like to work with the grid and you want to work with precision, you can actually move nodes using your nudge function. Now the nudge function is basically using your arrow keys. And to set up your nudge distance, what you can do is just double click on your ruler and this brings it into your ruler options and here we have the nudging distance which is the distance that objects or nodes are going to move when you hit the arrow keys. So my core draw is just doing a little save in the background. So a tenth of a millimeter is a little bit small. Let's choose two millimeters so that we can actually see something going on. And I'm going to make my super nudge four times my nudging distance and my micro nudge the half. I'm just going to say OK to that. So let's select this node and let's just hit the arrow key. And you can now see my nodes jumping about. If I hold down the shift key, I've got my, my super nudge, which is four times the distance. And if I hold down the control key, 
I've got a micro nudge. So setting up your nudging distances can also be very useful if you really want to work with precision with your nodes. Now at the moment we've been selecting nodes by using the shape tool. If I choose one of the other drawing tools, it just stays as a drawing tool. I can't actually select any nodes with this. But there is actually an option that you can choose by going again into the options, which will allow you to use the pick, the freehand, the Bezier or the polyline tool also as a node shaping tool. So let's just do that for a second. I'm going to go into tools, options, workspace, workspace and display. So up to the toolbar tool, options, workspace, display and what we need to do is we need to enable node tracking and node tracking will basically turn these tools into a shape tool cursor as soon as they move near to a node. So I'm just going to enable that and say OK. So if I now go over and choose one of the other tools, let's say the freehand tool, as I move near to a node, can you see it's just turning into a shape tool? And I personally find that really useful. It saves me a lot of time because if you look at these tools here, pick freehand, base and polyline, if you are working with the drawing tools, these are going to be tools that you're going to be using fairly frequently anyway, so why not set these up in the options to be used as a shape tool, it just saves you having to keep going back to the toolbox each time. Now here we have a polygon, again drawn with the polygon tool, and whenever you choose one of the nodes here, you can actually, as we've seen before, just move these. Um, basically synchronous to each other and whenever you add nodes here it's going to add nodes again to every single side so the polygon shapes behave a little differently to the shapes that you normally construct using the drawing tools but again um, you can move these and edit these nodes as you would any other adding and removing nodes now there are several ways of doing this and we're going to look at some of these um, methods. Now again, here I have my straight line and the simplest way to add a node is basically just double click. So that adds a node and another double click will remove the node again. You can of course, if you want to, go up to the property bar where you have these two icons here. So they're up here, they're quite tiny to see on the screen but they basically look like this and again clicking on this will add a node and again I can remove it. Now if you want to place nodes with absolute precision you can do the following. You can click once on the line and when you click once on the line, let's just zoom in here for a second, you get something that looks like a little star which is basically a placeholder for a node. And what I'm going to do now is hit my plus key. And what this has done is actually added this node um, to my line here. Now with this node still selected, I'm just going to change the colour here to make it easier to see. With this node still selected, if I hit the plus key again, it will generate another node between this node, which is selected, and the previous node. And this is the starting point, so this is the previous node. So let's hit the plus key. And now it's generated a node between my original node and the ending node. So I'm just going to undo this. And if you go around an object with your shape tool to select all three nodes, one, two, three, and I hit the plus key, then it's going to generate nodes at the intersection between existing nodes. And this is a really quick way of getting um, nodes placed at equal distances along a path. So you basically create a, a node on your line, you can double click or use the plus key and as long as a node is selected and you keep hitting plus, it's going to keep creating nodes in the middle of the preceding segment. So just 
summarizing that, to add nodes, use your shape tool and double click on your path and double click again to remove them. Or you can use the add nodes and delete nodes function on your property bar. And placing those with precision, create a placeholder and hit plus on your keyboard. And to add nodes at equal distances, just select your nodes and keep hitting plus. And this is going to keep adding nodes at equal distances between existing nodes. Now, it's all well and good to be able to add nodes to things, but there are certain situations when you really don't want too many nodes. So I've got a line here, and this line looks quite simple, and it's, it's looking a little bit rough because I drew this with my mouse on a not very mouse-friendly table, for example. And if I select this, I've just got so many nodes here. So I'm just going to zoom in here, and you can see all the nodes here. Now, up on the property bar, I have this small icon here, which is called Select All Nodes. So I'm just going to click on that, and it's going to select every node on the path. And as you can see, I've got way too many nodes, and because of this, it's giving me this rather jagged appearance. So there's a couple of things I can do here. Um, there are too many nodes here to just double click and remove them by hand. So I'm going to click on the Reduce Nodes button. And next to that, I have something called Curve Smoothness. Both of these Reduce Nodes, but in two completely different ways. The Reduce Nodes button will take away nodes, but only as far as not compromising the actual shape of the curve. So sometimes it won't actually remove many nodes at all. If I just add a couple of nodes here, just for the sake of argument, And then I'm just going to go back up here and just select my objects, select all nodes, and reduce it. You see a couple of nodes are, are being removed, but not really enough. If I use curve smoothness, on the other hand, it will reduce the nodes quite dramatically. But as you can see, the more nodes you remove, the shape is actually going to change here. So it's up to you to try and find a compromise. Um, between using reduced nodes and curve smoothness. Once you do have um, the right amount of nodes, you can, of course, go in here and start reshaping your curves. So why would we have too many nodes to start off with? Well, one reason, for example, is when you have a bitmap and you run this through power trace to turn it into a vector graphic, you can end up with objects, especially if you've got um, quite a high color depth, a lot of objects with a lot of nodes. And if you have a shape and you need to cut this out, for example, on a vinyl cutter, you really don't want lots and lots of nodes here. Um, sometimes using one of the tools here, for example, the eraser tool or the knife tool will also give you a similar situation. So I'm just going to drag through here. I'm going to break this apart. So now I have two objects. And if I select this object now with my shape tool again, you can see I've just got loads of nodes here, which I don't need. So let's basically select all the nodes. And now once again, I'm going to click on Reduce Nodes. And you can see it has taken away some of the nodes, but again, not enough. So what I'm going to do is, again, just reduce that uh, curve, uh, or increase the curve smoothness. And by doing this, I'm reducing the nodes. If you need to get, get rid of any more, of course, you can just select these and hit the delete button and just do a little bit of tidying up at the very end. Now, when you're actually using the drawing tools, we'll be looking at this when we get on to actually using the tools, you have an option in the property bar of the drawing tools to designate curve smoothness before you even start drawing. So you can either choose to have a curve that is very, very accurate and follows every movement of your mouse or graphics tablet, in which case you're going to probably have a lot of nodes, or you can choose to have a very high curve smoothness 
and you'll get less nodes, a smoother curve, but it won't perhaps follow every movement of your mouse in your document. Now, sometimes we might, we, might, we might actually want to take an object and break it apart because we might want to use just the part of an object. Or we might have another situation where we've got an object and we want to join up the nodes. Now, in the property bar, once we start using our shape tool, we're going to have some of these symbols here, join two nodes, break a curve apart, extend a curve to close the nodes. And let's just have a look at some of these. So here I have a circle, which I, I'm just going to turn this yellow again because I think it's easy to see. Let's just zoom in here. Which, before I, I drew the circle and then I went up to arrange and I basically converted my circle to curves and I have here four nodes. And what I'm going to do is actually click on here and up on my toolbar I've got this command break curve. So I'm going to click on that and what you might notice is I've now got these little arrowheads which show this node is no longer now a, a smooth node or a symmetrical node. It's actually a starting node going in this direction. So I'm now going to take this node and again I'm going to break this apart. So what is now my starting node has gone all the way around and I now have an end node here. And this segment, which has basically been isolated, has its own starting node and end node. But at the moment, if I go back to my pick tool, this is still one single object. If I move this around, we're not seeing really any difference. So what I need to do is go up to arrange and choose break curve apart. And once I've broken it apart, I now do have my separate segments, which I can now continue editing using my shape tool. So we might have a, another situation here where you've been using one of your pen tools and you've gone around the outside and you just haven't quite managed to join up the shape. So let me just zoom out for a second here. Now, um, with, there's a couple of ways of doing this. We can choose arrange and join nodes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this. You can see the nodes appearing here. And under arrange, sorry, join curves, that should be join curves and not join nodes, I have join curves. And this, just zoom in here again, is going to open up this docking window. And we've got several options here on how to join up this gap. We can extend it to a point, we can create a chamfer, we can create a rounded fillet, or we can put a Bezier curve there. Now what is really important here is the gap tolerance. I've got a gap tolerance of one millimeter, and what this means is that any gap of one millimeter or less will be joined up when I click on apply, but I've got the feeling, let's just move this away a little bit, that this is wider. So let's click on apply and probably we won't see any change at all. So nothing's happened. So let's just now change this gap tolerance, let's say five millimeters. And now when I click on apply, sorry I've got to select the nodes first, when I click on apply it will actually join those up. So if you're trying to join up your curve and nothing's happening, you might need to change or have a look at your gap tolerance. So the last scenario that we have here is when we have two completely separate objects. So this is not one curve that wasn't joined or one solid curve. I actually have two separate objects here. So the first thing we need to do, I'm just going to select these and zoom in. First thing we need to do is select our objects and go up to Arrange and Combine them. Once we've combined our objects, I can get my Shape tool. I'm going to go around these two nodes here, and now I've got the option to extend the curve to close. And this is then going to close that gap between two separate objects. So just to go over that again, you can take solid objects and by 
breaking the nodes apart and then breaking the whole thing apart under the Arrange menu, you can actually separate out segments of objects. If you have a single object and you haven't quite managed to join it up, you can actually click on this and choose Arrange and this should be Join Curves. And just join that up using the options in the Join Curves docking window. And if you have two separate paths that you need to join up, the first thing you need to do is combine them and then you can extend uh, the ends of your paths and join them up. So now we're going to be looking at some fun things. Um, we can also stretch and scale nodes and we can rotate and skew them. And we'll be using these symbols in the property bar. So rotate or skew nodes, stretch or scale nodes. So let's have a look at this object first. And what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to select all the nodes and just add a couple more by hitting the plus key. And now I'm going to deselect. And I'm just going to select every other node. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and just select every other node. Don't know if they've done that quite. And somehow that's not working for me. Let's just select all of them for the moment. Now up in when I, when I pull these, I've got some various options I can do. I can stretch them, I can skewer them, and you can see as you're doing this, you're getting some very interesting shapes appearing here. I'm just going to check if that, that's why it wasn't working properly. I need to convert it to curves. So let me just do this again. Just go back here. I'm just going to just very quickly draw another triangle here. Let's draw a polygon. So just quickly draw a triangle, make this a little bit thicker, and now I'm going to convert it to curves, that's the one step that I forgot, and with my shape tool, let's just select this again, hit plus to create a couple of more nodes, and this should work now, so holding down the shift key, there we go. Now, up on my property bar, I now have the stretch or scale nodes option. Now, if I drag in this direction, of course, it's going to move like this. I can also hold down the shift key and get some different shapes going here. So let's just select these nodes. I'm going to scale these again. So you can just use these for creating, again, some very interesting shapes. Move that out a little bit. So once you've selected your nodes, it's always good to just to check on the property bars which of these commands become available to you. Now, rotating nodes with polygons we've already seen. We don't actually have to do anything here. We just, with a polygon, just grab the nodes and twist them around. Here on the other side, I've got a circle. Let's just make sure I've converted that to curves. Yes, I've already converted that to curves. I'm just going to select this and just hit plus. And again, I'm going to use um, every second node. So let's just select these. I'm going to go up to my stretch or scale nodes and holding down my shift key, I'm just going to move these in a little bit. And now I'm going to combine that by clicking on the rotate or skew nodes button, and once I start rotating this, I can get some really interesting shapes going. Let's just do that again. My page was moving. So by scaling and rotating the nodes, you can actually get some very nice shapes. And to take this one step further, over in our toolbox, of course, we have something here called the Smart Fill Tool. And if I just choose, let's choose a color here and no outline, and what the Smart Fill Tool does is it recognizes where shapes overlap, so I can just go in here, let's just change this, 
and again just use this to create some really nice symmetrical interesting shapes so that's the rotating or skewing or stretching or scaling nodes so reversing the direction of a curve now, in certain situations, for example, vial cutting and embroidery, it's important that a curve does run in a specific direction because the curve direction is, at the end of the day, going to determine the direction in which the plotter knife or the embroidery needle moves. And if you've got a situation where you're trying to cut out vinyl and you find that the vinyl is puckering up at some point or the knife is not cutting the way you want it to do, you might need to just go and check which direction uh, your curve is actually running in. Now this situation of a curve being in the wrong direction normally happens when you have compound paths, which we'll be looking at, but it's very simple to reverse the direction of a curve. So if we look at this curve here, we can see here is my starting node, here is my end node, so my curve is running in this direction. Up on my toolbar, I have the command reverse direction. And once I reverse it, everything changes size. It's also a very quick way of changing the size that you have your arrowheads on, for example. Now, over here, on the other hand, I have a text object. So this is the letter O, and I can tell that because once I click on it with my shape tool, I actually see a letter appearing here. So the first thing I'm going to do is zoom in here, and I'm just going to convert this to a curve. And I don't know if you can see that here, let's just zoom in a little bit, but I might make this yellow, perhaps we can see a little bit better. And what you can see here is, is that this curve is running in this direction, and this curve is running in the other direction. And if for some reason you've got combined objects, another way of looking at your nodes, by the way, if you want to look at them properly is by going into wireframe view because this is going to give you a very good view of where your nodes are, where your paths are and what direction they're actually running in. So that's wireframe view. And if you do something like, let me just click on a node here. Um, if I click on a node and I want to change this direction, all I need to do is select a node and up here I've got reverse direction. So I click on that and now by reversing the direction I've got a combined path here, but I've got both running in the same direction. Let's see, oops, just zooming out here. Now if you're drawing and you're drawing freehand and you're drawing with a mouse, it can be quite difficult to get a shape even looking um, because it's sometimes it's quite hard to draw with a mouse and you might even find that you might want to invest in a small graphics tablet because that could be a, a real godsend when trying to draw something. But even if you're a little bit out of kilter here, it's quite easy using the align nodes command to grab some nodes and just align them. So I'm just going to select this object here change the color again and I'm just going to select around the top nodes so I've got these top three nodes selected and up in my property bar now I have the aligned nodes command and this will bring up a little window asking me do I want to align horizontally or vertically so in this case we want to align horizontally so I'm going to click on OK and let's do the same with the nodes at the bottom line nodes horizontally okay and the nodes are always going to align themselves um, after the last node that was selected because I drew my selection in this direction this is actually the last node that was selected which is why all of these nodes are lining up with this one here if you want to do a vertical alignment you can do that as well so I can select these two Go back up to Align and Vertical Alignment. Just do that here. 
and then just just going to move these across. So I need to do the whole thing here. And basically, by aligning your nodes, you can get some sort of symmetry going um, in hand draw drawn shapes. Now, something that's really a lot of fun is working in elastic mode. Now, I'm just going to delete these again and show you something. So I'm going to go over to my polygon tools. I'm going to grab my spiral. And I'm just going to draw a spiral here for you. Oops, it's going back here. Just hit the, sp hit the space bar to go back to my... Um, pick tool. Now, as you can see here, I've got a lot of nodes here. And if I just select all the nodes, normally if I grab a node, I've selected all the nodes and I move it, I'm basically moving the whole object. But if I go up to my toolbar and I click on the elastic mode icon, that looks like this here, the whole thing behaves as if it's a spring. Look at this. I can just drag this out. You can even feel the springiness as you're dragging your mouse button. So you can get, again, some very, very nice shapes going in elastic mode. Um, and this is because when you're in elastic mode, the nodes will move according to their relative distance to each other. So I'm just going to deselect here, select all of this. Now, this spiral, of course, is made up of lots of different curve segments. I can actually go up to my property bar and I can see here all of my segments between the nodes, all of these are curves. If I click on straight, I get a square spiral. I don't know if you can call that a square spiral. And now if I go into elastic mode and drag this out again, I can get some very interesting shapes going. So you can either work in elastic mode, and in which case the nodes behave very conservatively, or if you want to want to bring a little bit more dy uh, dynamics into your design, you can actually work using dynamic mode. Now, normally, let's just put a couple of nodes in here. I'm just going to select all of this. I'm going to hit the plus key. Now, I've already got some nodes here. I can see that. Now, as you can see here, I've got some nodes here, but they're not really online with each other, so I'm just going to hold down the shift key and select these nodes. I'm just going to align them quickly. Oops. Should not be doing this. So I've aligned these horizontally. Now normally, when you select two nodes and you move them, It's always the way, folks, that when you're doing a webinar and everyone's watching you, that sometimes the things don't behave as they should. So let's just, we're just going to draw another shape here. Just bear with me for a second. Let's convert this to a curve. And let's just add a couple of nodes here. I think, I think I know what was happening. I was still in elastic mode, and because I was in elastic mode, they weren't behaving normally. So I've taken off the elastic mode. I'm back into my default mode now, and normally, when you move two curves, they move in the same direction. However, you can also create symmetry in your shapes by going up to the property bar and choosing to reflect the nodes, basically mirroring the nodes, horizontally or vertically. So if I mirror those nodes horizontally now, instead of moving the same direction, they're going to be moving in a mirroring fashion. They're going to be moving towards each other or away from each other. Let's just do another couple of nodes here. Hold down my shift key to select both of these. And now I'm going to mirror the nodes vertically. And again, you're going to have the same result that they move in opposite directions to what you would normally expect them to. But again, you can use this mirroring feature to create some symmetrical shapes and also some rather unusual shapes. So I'm just going to deselect these again so I don't have any mishaps. 
Now, working with compound paths, we've already seen that we can take an object, such as a text object, and turn this into a curve. So I'm just going to select these for a second and zoom in. So this is a regular text object. And I just went up to a range and converted that to curves. And this object now is now made up of curves. Get my shape tool, we can see the paths here. If I go into my wireframe view again, I can see my paths here. I can do the following. I could just click on a node and I can break this apart. We've seen this before. But once I break it apart, I, I've still got my path here, but it's made, basically converted the whole thing to one compound path. There's also another thing, however, that I can do. So here you can see my paths here. If I take this letter here, you can see that's got even more separated areas here. I've got different areas in here. I'm going to check if that's converted to curves. And what I want to do here is, I'm going to click on a node, and I just want to separate this area out from the whole of the letter here. So up on my toolbar, I'm going to click on the symbol here, which is called Extract Subpath. And what you can see here, it's turned blue, but if I go back to the Pick tool by hitting the space bar, I'm just going to hold the Alt key. Um, if you hold the Alt key, by the way, when you're clicking on an object, it will actually select an object that's hidden behind another object. So I'm just going to grab that and drag it out. And you can see, by extracting a subpath, we've now created an object that was created out of this path within this object here. So let's do this one more time. I'm going to get my shape tool. Click here again. I'm going to click on one of the nodes on this inside path. And again, up here, I'm going to click on Extract Subpath. So hit my space bar to go back to my Pick tool. And now holding down my Alt key, I'm going to click again. And here again is an object created from that subtracted, uh, extracted subpath. So again, you can use nodes and the paths and extracting the subpaths to again create objects that might be otherwise quite difficult to draw freehand, but you can take your objects that you converted to curves and just split them up into their separate elements. Um, I've been going up to a range to break curves apart, but you can also use Control Q, which is the keyboard shortcut. So, so far we've had a look at three types of nodes, two types of segments. We've had a look at how we can add nodes and remove them, and also how we can move nodes and move them in, into elastic mode, etc. So when we now start to work with our eight curve tools, it will be much easier for us afterwards to, to take those paths that we've created and reshape them. Now, the curve tools are in the toolbox over here, and by default, you'll see when you first open up Draw the Freehand tool. If, however, you use one of the other tools in the meantime, this will appear in your toolbox instead, but all the tools are still here within the flyout menu. Now, only two of the tools have an actual keyboard shortcut, and this is the Artistic Media tool, which has the key short, um, keyboard shortcut I and the freehand tool, which has F5. If you use any tools or any um, other commands in QuadDraw quite frequently, it might make sense to give that command or that tool a keyboard shortcut. So I'm just going to show you that quite quickly. So I'm going up to Tools and down to Customization. And what we can do is we go down to Commands. And in this case, I'm going to go down to my Toolbox. And let's go down to my B-spline tool. So here's my B-spline tool. And then I'm going to click on the shortcut key tab. And as we can see here, there isn't actually any key shortcut assigned currently. So I can give it the key shortcut, for example, 
Alt B. And I'm just going to assign that. So now my B spline tool now has a keyboard shortcut, Alt B, and already I've changed to that tool. I personally really like working with shortcut keys if because everyone has their favorite tools at the end of the day, and shortcut keys just make everything so much faster. Now, we have eight curve tools. Each tool has unique curves that help identify it, and each of these eight drawing tools are task-oriented. With these tools, you can draw a path that can be either open or closed. And if you are, for example, a printer or somebody who's using CorelDRAW and Adobe Illustrator, in Adobe Illustrator, you can draw an open shape. And even though it's not closed, you can fill this shape with some sort of color or fill. If you want to have exactly the same effect in CorelDRAW, because CorelDRAW by default doesn't fill open shapes, you can go to your Tools, Options, Document, General and choose the option Fill Open Curves and then you can actually fill open curves as well. So let's have a quick look now at our curve tools. So the first tool we're going to look at is the freehand tool. That's this one here. And the freehand and the Bezier tools, you can do a little bit of minimal tweaking. Um, of the settings by going into the options and the workspace and toolbox and tweaking the settings. I, I normally don't bother to change the settings myself as I find it works quite well. Now before I start drawing with the freehand tool, let's take a quick look at the property bar. At the moment I have a default line thickness set up for 2 millimeters, and this slider bar here is really important. Normally by default it's set to 50. It's gone to 100 here. Let's go down to 50. This is normally a default setting. And, this, and the um, freehand smoothing is going to give you a balance between the accuracy of the curve that you're drawing and the amount of nodes that you get. So let's just draw, for example, I'm just going to draw a curve. I'm doing this with my mouse, by the way. So you can see I've got a few little um, not very smooth corners here, and at the moment I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine curves. Let's up the smoothing to a hundred percent, and let's just try to reproduce that. So now I've only got one, two, three, four curves, so I've got a much smoother curve and far fewer nodes. And finally, let's just bring this all the way down to zero. And let's just try doing that again. And now I've got to look how many nodes I've got now. So really, it's your decision um, how accurate, when you're drawing freehand, how accurate you want it to be. If you want it to, move, to record basically every single movement of your mouse or your graphics tablet, you're going to tend towards the lower end of the smoothing scale. If you want just really nice, easy on the eye curves, then you're going to basically increase your smoothing or have a smoothing between 50% um, uh, or higher. So let me just remove these for a second. Now I'm going to um, go back to my freehand tool. And the freehand tool is easy to use. You drag it, and when I let go of my mouse button, the line is finished. If I want to do a straight line, I click. I let go of the mouse button, so I'm not holding any mouse, but, mouse button down at the moment. I just drag it to where I want it to be, and then I click again for a straight line. If you want to constrain your line so that it's absolutely horizontal or vertical, you hold down the control key, and the control key, as you can see here, it's giving me a, vert a horizontal line or a vertical line or increments, in my case, of 15 degrees, but again, you can set up these increments in your um, tool options. Now, when I just going to click to finish this, if I'm drawing something and I don't really like what I've drawn, you can actually undo this with the freehand tool. So I'm just going to start drawing, and I hope you're going to be able to see this. And oops, I've made a mistake here. 
So I'm going to hold down the shift key and as I move back over the line, I hope you can see that the line is turning red. So I'm moving back over the line, holding down the shift key, and when I let go, it's undone that curve to that position. So the freehand tool has a little line correction built into it. And that is basically all there is to the freehand tool. Click, let go, and click for straight lines. Click and, dry, click and drag for wavy lines. Before you start drawing, it's always advisable to set up your curve smoothing here. Otherwise, you're going to have to start reducing your nodes, and we don't really want any extra work. And hold down the shift key to undo the line. So on to the next tool. And this is the two-point line tool. Now, the two-point line tool has been enhanced in Quadra X5. So let's just choose this tool here, two-point line. Now, it just used to be a straightforward click and drag, let go, and there's your line. Now, in this version of Quadra, we have two other variations. We have a perpendicular two-point line and a tangential two-point line. Holding down the control key allows you to snap, but also allows you to draw beyond the snapping points. So let's have a look at this. So I've just drawn a straight line that's fairly straightforward. Now up in the property bar, I'm going to go from two-point line to perpendicular two-point line. And when I click here and drag, you can see now wherever I move my line, it's going to be perpendicular to this object that I'm drawing it from. Let's go now to the tangential two-point line. Now, I'm just going to check, first of all, if I've got objects snapping on. Because if, if snapped objects is not on, let's just turn this off for a second. And I, I'm starting here at my quadrant, or I want to start on my quadrant, but I'm not even seeing my quadrant because I don't have any objects snapping on. So let's go back up here, turn on snap to objects, and now I can actually see where I want to start drawing this line. So I'm going to go over here and it's going to snap onto this quadrant. If I hold down my control key, I can go way beyond this, but it's still snapping to that point. So that is the tangential two-point line tool. Um, up in the property bar, of course, you've got the other um, properties here like um, line thickness and rotation, etc. So two-point line tool, a very simple tool to use. The Bezier tool. Now the Bezier tool is named, of course, after Pierre Bezier. It's one of the oldest tools in any vector graphics drawing program, but it's also a tool that you either love or you hate. Because if I turn this, if I choose this tool now, when you're using the Bezier tool, as you're clicking, you can't actually see what you're drawing. You don't have a line preview. So you just have to hope for the best and click, and then you'll see the line as it's being drawn. Um, you can actually really get used to working with this, and it's used a lot, for example, for doing tracing, which we'll have a look at in a second. Now, if I just click, let me just get rid of this one first. If I just click and click and click, I'm creating straight segments. If I drag and click, I'm creating curves. And as I'm drawing, I'm actually getting the control handle. So while I'm drawing and I'm holding down the left mouse button, I'm actually controlling the curve of the line. Now, if I hold down the C, I can get a cusp node. If I continue drawing here and hold down S, I'm going to get a smooth node. So let's go to our shape tool and just look at this. So I'm going to click on this node here. And I can see as I was holding down, let's just move this handle out of the way here. I can see that as I was holding down the letter C, it has actually, if I check in the property bar, given me a cusp node. So I can get a really sharp angle going. And down here, if I check in the property bar, while I was holding down the letter S, it's given me a smooth node. So you can actually, so you have to basically, you're clicking and you're dragging and 
you can actually, if you know roughly what sort of shape you're aiming at, by holding down the C or the S keys, you can actually create custom smooth nodes as you're going along. So the next thing I want to do is just zoom in around this bitmap here. Now, this is a bitmap that I brought in. I've made the bitmap semi-transparent because I want to trace over it. And I've just right-clicked and locked this bitmap to the page so it's not moving anywhere. Um, a lot of people have perhaps older blueprints or things they need to get in and they just want to draw over. And the Bezier tool is really useful for doing this. So I'm just going to do some straight clicks here. That wasn't very straight, was it? Let's start again. Click, 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 click. It doesn't matter if I'm making mistakes here because I can actually go in and, and as I'm going around and dragging, you can see I can actually get a really good curve going here. Because as I'm dragging, I'm visually moving my control handles to give me the curve that I want. And when I'm finished, I can just go back up here and join that up. Now, it doesn't really matter that it's not particularly accurate, because with my shape tool, I can go in here and edit any of the nodes just to get that in the right shape. Or I can remove some of the nodes here if I've got too many and just straighten that out. So the Bezier tool is really quite useful for doing um, um, shaping. Now, I just want to show you something else while I'm, while I'm here. Here I have a node, and you might, uh, a control handle, and you might notice that as I pass over another control handle, it becomes transparent. Also, if you pass over another node, you'll get the ends of the control handles changing. This is just to let you know that you do, in fact, have another node or a control handle under there. Um, one other thing that I'd like to show you, I'm just going to zoom in here. Let's just make this a little bit thicker. Now I've got two handles here. And what it's very easy to do, but what it's not a good idea to do is, is that while you're reshaping an object, you might at some point cross over. So I've basically taken my right control handle, and I'm crossing over the path of the left control handle. Now, visually on the screen, that might look OK. But you might have issues when you try to print it out, or especially if you want to cut this out of vinyl. So do make sure that, you, if possible, you're not crossing over any of your paths while you're using the tools. The pen tool is a very, very simple tool. It has a lot of similarities with the Bezier tool, except that you can actually see what you're drawing before you actually click. So I'm going to click here, click for straight lines, and this time I can actually see where I'm going. And again, I can drag and I'll get the similar handles as with the Bezier tool. So for this reason, a lot of people do prefer to actually use the pen tool, double click to finish the line. Now, if you're drawing open shapes, you might at some point um, want to join them up. So you can join the nodes, or you can just basically continue clicking and just join them up here. Now, some of the drawing tools allow you to join them up and create solid shapes from two open paths. So whenever you move your drawing to over the end node and you see the shape of it changing, you can more than likely or not um, join up your path. If I just go back to my freehand tool quickly, I'm just going to join something here, go away. As I move back, watch how the shape of my curves change. It will change from a squiggly line into an arrow and once I've got that little arrow curves, it means I can continue drawing my line. So again, I've got an open shape here. But once I get this little arrow beneath my curves, I can join up my shapes and then fill that with color and make it a solid shape. So don't give up all hope if you've drawn something and you can't get a filling into it because you perhaps haven't joined the ends up properly. You can use the drawing tools just to join up the ends and fill your objects. 
So the artistic media tool. Now this is a tool that's completely different um, from all of the tools we've had before. I'm just going to, folks, just bear me a second, I'm just going to check in here. Okay, I'm, I'm running a little bit late, folks. I'm very sorry about this, but um, it's easier to easy to lose track of time when you're showing these things. But we're nearly finished. Um, we're on slide 25, and we've got 29 slides. The artistic media tool allows you to paint with vector shapes. So we're leaving the realm of straight lines now, and we're going to paint with vectors. So over here, I'm going to choose my artistic media brush, and I have five different brushes to choose from. I have presets, and in the presets I can choose the width, and I've got a whole list to choose from, so I'm just going to draw a shape here. And while this shape is selected, I can actually go up here and choose any of the other shapes, and it will automatically update on screen. Let's just change the color of this, and with my shape tool, you can see this actually has a path running through the middle of it, so as with the other curve tools, you can actually change the shapes of things that you draw with the artistic media tool. We also have an artistic media docker down here and this can be used. Here I have a circle and I can just basically grab one of my presets and drag it onto an existing shape and that again is going to give me some really nice effects. But going back to our artistic tool, the next one along we have is the brush. And the brush has all sorts of different categories here. So you've got artistic brushes. And you go down here, you have all sorts of different artistic brushes to choose from. Give that a nice color here. And again, while it's selected, you can just go in here and change the shape and the form anytime you like and use your control handles to move these. Moving along, go back to the artistic media tool. We have a spray can, and a spray can works a little bit different. It actually sprays objects onto the page. So again, go down these lists, find something that you like, and you can just spray this onto the page. Let's just remove these quickly. I'm sorry that I'm going a little bit fast now, but um, we're already over the time, and I don't want to miss anything with you. Um, the calligraphy tool is fantastic. You can put an angle in here, because as you know, if you were drawing with a calligraphy pen, depending on the angle, you'd have some parts of the letter becoming thin and some thick. And you can just go up here and change the angle. And this then will give you a different looking shape to your letters. Now, if you have a graphics tablet, which I do have, you've got the pressure pen here. Now, with the mouse, you're not really going to see much because the mouse doesn't have pressure sensitivity. But if I just quickly plug in my Wacom tablets, because I'd just like to show you this quickly, because I'm sure that some of you do have a tablet at home. So I'm just plugging that in. I'm just hoping it's going to be recognized. And what we need to do first is just to set up our pen. So under Tools, Options, Display, we can actually set up our pen tablet to work with the artistic media tool. So I'm just going to configure that by just doing a couple of strokes from light to heavy. OK. I've got to draw five. OK. And now, when I choose my artistic media tool and the pressure pen, if I draw very lightly, I get a very small stroke. But as I increase the pressure, the stroke width increases as well. So you can do some wonderful expressive design work using the pressure pen. Um, you can also create new brushes and new sprayers just by selecting objects, clicking on the Save button, and this will give you the option to save your own shapes as either brushes or sprayers. 
but I'm not going to bother saving that now, but you ju can just save it here. And when you save your own brushes and sprayers, these actually appear um, in the custom settings. So you'll drop down to custom, and I basically turn this shape into a custom brush. I chose the wrong one here, sorry. Custom. And this is basically this shape here with a blend, saved as a brush, and I can now paint with this brush and it looks like a tube. So moving on, the polyline tool is very, very simple. It combines basically the features of the freehand and the Bezier tool. So straight clicks give you straight lines and dragging you can see my arrow turning here, so dragging gives you free hand lines. So that's basically all there is to the um, polyline tool. Again, if you don't want too many nodes, be sure to set up your free hand smoothing before you start drawing. Now the beast line tool is new in Coral Draw. Um, I'm just going to choose this quickly. And as I draw with the beast spline tool, it's not actually drawing from node to node. It's putting down a path between the nodes. And when I choose my shape tool, I'm not selecting nodes with control handles. What I've got here is a floating control point. So I can move this around, and wherever I move it, I'm getting beautifully smooth curves. If I want to get more of an angle in here, I can clamp down my node in the property bar here, and with the node clamped, I can get a much sharper angle to my B-spline curves. If you want to do proper node editing with a B-spline, you need to go up to a range, convert this to curves, and then again you have a proper path here where you can control your nodes again. So that is the B-spline tool. And the last of our drawing tools for today is the three-point curve, which is also very simple. You drag out to determine the baseline width of a curve. So I've dragged out with my left mouse button. I release, and now I can determine what shape curve I want. And once I've got my curve, I can start adding nodes and reshaping it. So that is the end of our webinar, and thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this session. Um, please visit the resources page at www.coral.com for more information on webinars and uh, video tutorials. I'm just going to see now if there are any questions in here. Hi, Suzanne. Uh, Therese again. I do have a couple of questions I'd like to, that a couple of users have, and I can uh, refer them to you. So uh, one question that was that an attendee brought up was uh, they're wondering which of the add, delete, place nodes with precision and create multiple nodes tools are available in Corel Draw Graphics v X4. Sorry, in Corel Draw Graphics Suite X4. So uh, which of the um, add nodes, delete nodes? The uh, that that's basically that that is the same in X4. Um, mm -hmm. Clicking on, let me just um, let me just go back here. A couple of, let me just, I've just opened up a new page. So the adding nodes. If I just draw a line here very quickly, let's just draw a beast line. Just so using the shape tool to create a placeholder. That's an X4. Um, when you've got a placeholder hitting the plus key, it's also in X4. And uh, what else was, was the question, Aries? Uh, yes, so the add, delete, place nodes with precision, and create multiple node tools. Uh, That's with... in X4 as well. That's in X4 yeah. as well. Okay. So, yes. Uh, the second question was, uh, one attendee was wondering if you could throw provide a quick demo of uh, fitting text to path on a spiral. Yes. Should I do that now? Yes. 
Right, there are two ways of putting text on a path. I grab my text tool. I'm going to show you the first option is grabbing your text tool. I'm just going to type some text here. And then with my text selected, I go up to text. And I choose, I'm going to draw another shape here just to show you how this works. So select my text tool. And under text, I'm going to go fit text to path. Now, it will actually, as I move from object to object, the text actually recognizes the object. So I could put my text here. And you see the red line appearing. That's showing you the midpoint of the object and the text. And the little blue numbers underneath are showing you the distance from the path. So I could put this here. Or I could have it running along this path here. Let's just put this down here. Now, when I place the text here, of course, this is the wrong way around. So what I can do is, up on the property bar, I can mirror the text vertically, and I can mirror it horizontally, and I've got the text the right way around. So I can just drag that out a little bit again. And if you don't want to see the circle, you can just click on the circle and right-click in the color palette on No Color. And this is then basically going to make this path invisible. But again, if you go into wireframe mode, you can see that the path is still there. And the other option that you have is grabbing your text tool. Now, as you can see, watch what happens. Let's just zoom in. What, I'm going to make my path here yellow so we can see what's happening here. Right, I'm grabbing my text tool. And as I move close to the path, the cursor will change to a wavy line. Can you see that wavy line appearing? And when you get that wavy line on your cursor, if you click, you can then start typing directly on your path. And to move it, again, you go back to your pick tool and just move this up or below, just move it along your path. So there are two ways of actually getting text to flow along a path. Are we still online, Aris? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was uh, okay. I got caught up in a few okay. things in the question sorry. panel. Uh, there are a couple more questions coming in. Okay. Uh, sorry about the, the dead air there. Uh, so no, no problem. One other question was, uh, when you have two paths, we saw how to separate them. Uh, yes. Can you show us how to combine them uh, using a... Um, are we talking... Okay, hang on. Um, right. Let's go back to my freehand tool. I'm just going to make this a little bit thicker to start off with so we can see what we're doing. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to, so there's one way of doing this. You just draw. And here I've got a path. And if I've got another path here, I've got a couple of ways of doing this. I can either join straight on by moving my drawing tool to the end node. And again, you can see the curves are changing to an arrow. This allows me just to continue drawing. And this is now, pardon me, one object. I'm not two separate objects. If I have two objects, let's say I've got this object here and this object here. So these are two completely separate objects. I need to, let me just delete this. I need to select them, combine them, and then I can join the curves. I'm sorry, then I can go back to my shape tool, select the two nodes that I want to join, and then I can close this. It's not working for me now. Hang on. Right. Ah, sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. And then I can click on Extend Curve to close. If I've got a single object and I want to close it, in a particular manner. So let's say I've got this object here and I've got quite a large gap. Uh, 
I can select the two end nodes and I can choose Arrange Join Curves. And in this case, it's going to give me this docking window where I can choose how I want to join up the ends. So I could join it up with a curve, with a fillet, with a chamfer, etc. Let's say fillet, I don't know if this is going to work. And how it joins will depend on the gap. If your gap is larger than your gap tolerance, it won't close, because it's only going to close if it's, in this case, 5 millimeters or less. I'm just going to click on Apply. So this is obviously larger than 5 millimeters. Let me just go in here. So I'm just going to raise this up a little bit here, because it's obviously a bit larger. And now it's joined, because obviously the gap here was between 5 and 10. Um, once it's joined up, you've actually got an, an object where everything's joined up, and you can actually fill it as well. So it really depends on what you're, if you're joining up separate objects, if you're joining objects that are it's one object but it's got a gap in it or if you're drawing and you discontinue and want to continue again then you can join straight on to the end of that okay Suzanne was, uh, was that all? yes okay so at this point uh we ran a little bit over time, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, for hosting. You're um, very welcome. Absolutely. Uh, if you have asked a question in the question panel and your question wasn't answered in this, don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you. We'll be able to email you an answer uh, after the webinar is over. So I would like to thank everyone who attended. If you uh, are using an older version of Draw, I just want to let you know that you can find more information about Corel Draw Graphics Suite X5 on our website at www.corel.com slash CorelDraw. You can also download a free trial there. It's uh, good for 30 days. And uh, we hope to see you again at our next webinar. So thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.